That's not true. You're not alone. Don't be afraid. Let me help. I love you. I'm with you. It's okay. Keep going. Remember, that's a lie. I'm with you. I'm proud of you. You're not alone. You are too valuable. I'm more than just a feeling when you worship. I'm the spirit of the living God. I'm your helper and counselor. Well, hello. Uh, we are so glad that you're here. Welcome to Restoration Church Online. Uh, and yeah. And uh, you're like, wait, there are people in the building. Yes, I want to, before we dive into the message, just shout out all of our staff and many uh, very special servant leaders here with the production team and the worship team and the operations team that have really, over the last 72 hours, just been so flexible and so hardworking uh, to really help make this happen, building new websites, creating new calendars and new ways for us to engage. And just to say thank you, uh, for many of you who have given generously in the past so that this decision to go online only uh, f- while we face this challenge in our community was actually for us quite an easy one. Uh, we already had the technology in place uh, to create a really uh, exceptional live uh, experience for you to watch right now in your home or wherever you are, maybe watching later, uh, and f- to help other churches as well that don't have that technology. They're either meeting in school or are portable in some other way, and we get to be a gift and a resource to them so that the Church of Jesus moves forward. Because uh, like Pastor Katie said, these are the moments in our history, in our culture, in our society when the church needs to rise and step up. That All throughout the first century, uh, followers of Jesus, the church exploded because they did what other people wouldn't. And they engaged people uh, that had diseases or that had fear. Uh, and so that's what we want to do. That's who we want to be as a church. And so uh, ultimately the church has never been about services. It's always been about how we serve people. It's never been about people in buildings, but it's always been about building people. And it's never been about our comfort. It's always been an invitation to step into courage with the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I'm so excited for this teaching series that we're going to be in for the next three weeks as we engage God's Word, learning about uh, a part of the Trinity, the personhood of God, that is so essential to our life, to our growth, to our experience as a follower of Jesus, but often is misunderstood or you know unengaged with, perhaps, uh, for many of us. And so I thought what would be a fun way to kind of kick off uh, this conversation that we're in today uh, is to talk about something that seems utterly unspiritual, but I, I promise you it's going gonna, it's gonna to connect. Uh, I don't know about you, I, I love music. I love all kinds of music, uh, except for country. Uh, so um, like I said, I love music. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's, there's lots of different kinds of uh, musical groups. Uh, some of you just logged off. It's okay. Uh, we'll see you next week. Um, but I thought it'd be interesting to kind of walk through to see, and this is kind of a quiz. Uh, you're just testing yourself because you're practicing social distancing, right? So don't let uh, it get in the way. Uh, but we probably know some of these groups. Anybody know who this group is? Yeah. Come on. That's a, no, it's, that's the Beatles. Uh, that's the Beatles. Very good. Uh, and so Beatles has a couple members, uh, some of them more well-known than others. You probably know who this is. John Lennon, iconic picture of John Lennon. Uh, do you know who this is? George Harrison, that's right. Or uh, Pastor Michael Pinning's doppelganger is, is uh, also, uh, also acceptable. Uh, do you know this group? You probably know this group. Jackson 5, I have a daily relationship with the Jackson 5 because ABC is the first song in my iTunes library. Uh, and so I get in the car, the Bluetooth connects, and it just automatically comes on unless I change it. Sometimes I don't, all right, taking kids to school. Uh, so we all know the leader of the Jackson 5, even though the youngest member, Michael Jackson. Uh, do you know this member of the Jackson 5? I'll give you a hint. It's not Janet. <laughs> this is Jermaine, Jermaine Jackson. Man, that hair is impressive. Uh, all right, do you know who this musical group is? We're bringing a little more recent, a little more recent. You got some, got some woos. Uh, 
teen bop imagery of, you know, posters on walls is coming up in your mind. Uh, the, the early 2000s was quite a time for male fashion. Uh, these are choices that we made as a community. All right, so you know this is NSYNC. Uh, we all know the presumed leader of NSYNC. I don't know if that's actually true, but it seems like it, right? Look at that. Look at the curls. Just lovely. Uh, you know, Justin Timberlake, uh, this person is not Jimmy Fallon's best friend, has not won a Grammy. Anybody know this guy's name? The actual founder of NSYNC. Chris, no love. No love for Chris. Um, someone, here, someone here knew, true fan. All right, we'll bring it local. Last one. Do we know who this is? Yes, we know this is Switchfoot San Diego royalty. And this is the only white Christian uh, artist who's ever made rapper money, John Foreman. All right, we all know lead singer of Switchfoot is John Foreman. Do you know who this member of Switchfoot is? No names. Someone is sending in a fake prayer request right now. I know who it is. Uh, no, this is Jerome. He leads the back line of Switchfoot. This is a very, very important person. So here's, here's how this applies, right? And, and you're like, okay, get to the point. The point is, is that there are things that we love and engage with and groups that we say we're fans of that we don't know members of that group. We, we know some, we feel like we're connected. Everybody knows Beyonce, but who are the other members of Destiny's Child? Destiny's Children? I don't know, how, whatever the plural is, right? We, we, we have a connection with some, but, but not with the whole group. And specifically for us, as we engage with this conversation about the Holy Spirit, I think many of us have that same engagement when it comes to the Trinity, the personhood of God, that in the very beginning of the scriptures, the, the Bible says that God refers to himself, himself, themself as plural. Let us make man and woman in our image. Uh, and so it's this, it's this unique concept that there's actually three members of the Trinity. There's the Father, there's the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And my guess is you've probably heard that before. That's not brand new information. That's like, I, why did I log in for that? Believe me, we're gonna go somewhere else with that. But just many of us understand that. But when it comes to the practical nature of our life as we engage with the person of God, with the Trinity, the threefold personhood of God, for many of us, we have this understanding of God the Father. God is in heaven. You know, have this picture based on, you know, really, you know, un characteristic art from, you know, the middle of the 14th century of this big, long beard. You know, God is basically Santa Claus without a shirt on, but buff kind of a situation, right? That's God the Father, uh, very, very Zeus-esque, very informed by that. We, we understand Jesus. I mean, you know, empowering people to love and follow Jesus is the central mission of our church here at Restoration Church. And, and we have this concept of, yeah, Jesus, the Savior, the person who came to earth. But then the third person, the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, is often one that we distance ourselves from, when in fact, ironically, that is the person of the Trinity that we are supposed to be closest to, the one that we can actually engage with theologically and personally and practically the most. And so uh, to start our conversation up today, I want to ask us the real question is, are you, am I, are we settling for a two-thirds God? For a two-thirds God. The power that's available to us, the presence that's available to us, the relational connection that we have available to us with God, if we distance ourselves from the Holy Spirit, are we settling for a two-thirds God? I remember um, I was a freshman in high school, and we got our progress report, uh, which is always a nervous time, uh, at least for me. Uh, and, and I don't know about you, what were kind of considered good grades or not so good grades in your house. Uh, A's were obviously encouraged. Uh, B's were permissible. Uh, C's had consequences. Uh, you know, that was just how it stood in our house. And then D's never happened. And I remember the first uh, progress report I got as a freshman in history class, which I loved history. I was just lazy. Uh, I got my first D on a progress report. And my parents, not thrilled. Mom and dad, if you're watching on live stream, you remember this. They picked me up from school. And whenever both parents pick you up from school, it was a problem. That was kind of a situation. Like, that was always the tell. And uh, they had my progress report, uh, and, and we were talking about it, and I saw, I saw the D. And I remember thinking later as I was, like, building my case in my room and going through all the, the consequences I had to face because of, because of my poor grade, I remember thinking, I got over two-thirds of the points. Like, if I was in Major League Baseball, I'd be making millions upon millions of dollars. And again, as a 15-year-old, I'm like building up this case to go down and tell my parents. I had two-thirds of it. 
I had two thirds of, of the, the right answers. And, and yet for many of us, we, we know that feeling two thirds doesn't help us feel like we're connected, doesn't help us feel like we're winning. And yet for many of us, when it comes to our relationship with God, if we're honest, we practically at least engaged with or settled for only two thirds. And yet Jesus has some incredible things to say about the promise and the presence of the personhood and fullness and power of God available to us in the Holy Spirit. In fact, uh, one of the last things that he says on the planet uh, in Acts chapter one, verses six through eight, it's on the screen right left of me. Uh, it says this. So when the apostles were with Jesus, this is the last time they're going to be together. They kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? I mean, they are selfless, world-focused people, right? When are we gonna get what we've been waiting for? And Jesus replied, the Father alone has set the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere, here in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, even in Samaria, and of course, to the ends of the earth. And again, in this moment, we have an experience with all three members of the Trinity in conversation. Jesus is there in front of them in the flesh, the presence of God in human form. They've followed him for three years. They've trusted in him. They've watched him get murdered and come back to life. And now they are ready to take on the world. And they ask him this question. And he says, actually, God the Father is who sets those dates, but you're gonna receive the Holy Spirit, the presence of God in you that's gonna empower you to do the things that you don't think you can do. I mean, this is the promise of Jesus, that when the Holy Spirit shows up, you will be able to do things that seem impossible, that seem crazy, that seem beyond your power, beyond your control. And I think it's so poignant for us to engage in this conversation here and now, 2,000 years later, thousands and thousands of miles away from where these words were first spoken, because the truth of the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life and mine has never been more applicable and never been more necessary than perhaps in this moment in our culture where we face fear, uncertainty, unprecedented times, uh, at least in my lifetime, where, where people don't know where to turn for help. And perhaps you, even this morning, are logged in to watch this because you're wondering, where is God? Where is God in this time, in this fear, in these questions? Uh, and the reality is, and this is what I hope we, gra we grapple with and hopefully receive this morning, is that the presence of God, that question, where is God? Is God is here. That God is actually with you and in you. And in fact, not just in some eth ethereal and kind, like, oh, that's nice and sweet sense. The reality is that the Holy Spirit in you is more powerful than anything that comes at you. That the Holy Spirit of God that is within you is more powerful than anything that comes at you. Anything you can face in your life, anything that you're afraid of, anything that doesn't go your way, anytime that you come across something that you don't understand, the reality is, is that the presence of God available to you in the person of the Holy Spirit that is in you is far more powerful than anything that will ever come at you. And we've seen this throughout history that people that have followed Jesus, that have received the gift and the presence of the Holy Spirit, or able to face death, face criticism, face persecution, face torture. And not that those things all got, you know, taken away and everything went well for them, but they were able to face it with peace, with hope, with joy in the midst of challenging circumstances. That in fact, the Apostle Paul, while chained, most likely in a rotting Roman cell, wrote to the church in Galatia and said that the fruit of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, that these are the things that come out of our life when we're connected and walking in step with the Holy Spirit. That for most of us, though, we're honest, we think love comes from a person, or joy comes from having enough in our life, enough resources, or enough time, or enough success. That peace comes from a lack of problems in our circumstances. But on and on and on, all of these things that, that, that Paul writes that God wants you to know are gifts, are fruits, are experiences of the Holy Spirit they don't come from success or people or circumstances. They come from the presence of God. And so to dive in, I want us to look at this promise that Jesus makes. that He tells his first followers, and I believe he tells us today, of who this person of the Holy Spirit is. And so if you have a Bible, you can go to John chapter 14, uh, verse, we're going to start in verse 6. Uh, you can actually, if you're on restorationchurchsd.com slash live, you can just open a new tab and go to uversion.com and type in John 14, 6. Uh, or you can open up your own Bible at home. 
or we can have it on the screen uh, while we're talking through it. But this is an incredible promise that Jesus makes to his followers that I believe is going to be impactful for you this morning. So I'll give you a minute to turn there. So again, Jesus is having a conversation with some of his closest friends, and, and they're, they're facing some trouble. They're facing some challenge as a community, and he communicates to them this promise that I think is so powerful. And so he says this. He's talking to them. He says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life, and no one comes to God the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And so from now on, you do know him and you have seen him. What Jesus is doing here in this moment is he is letting his followers know for the very first time that he and God are connected, that him and God are one, he would later go on to say. And again, in this moment, this is blasphemy. This is a capital offense in his culture. And this sets him apart from anyone else of his contemporaries. That Everybody had a great rabbi and a good teacher that they followed. And he says, hey, guys, I want you to know I'm more than just a really wise teacher. I'm more than just a witch doctor doing some cute tricks and turning water into wine and healing people. But actually, when you see me, when you know me, you know God the Father. And again, I'm sure his, you know, his followers would be like, Jesus, we're kind of already in trouble. <laughs> we're already on the run. Keep it down. But Jesus doubles down and says, actually, Philip asks him and says, Lord, show us the Father and it'll be enough for us. Again, Philip still, like many of us, understands as a separate concept. And Jesus said to him, have I been, you, been with you this long and you still don't know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? These words that I say to you, I don't speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works through me. So believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe the accounts of the works themselves. Basically saying, look around, look at the evidence. Have you ever seen anything like this? Philip doesn't respond because I think he's starting to get it, like many of us, I hope, will this morning. He says, truly I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and even greater works than these will they do because I'm about to go to the Father. And this is a central verse for our culture here at Restoration Church. That as we crafted our mission of empowering all people to love and follow Jesus, John 14 was the chapter that we were drawn to where he, Jesus promises us as his body, as his followers later, that we would do even more incredible things through his power than he even did on the planet. And for so many of us, that's not our experience of church. That's not our experience uh, in a relationship with God. And I believe that it's because we missed this next part that Jesus is about to say that actually the reason you'll be able to do even greater things than I've been able to do is because I'm leaving. It's because I'm going back to the Father, back to heaven, their understanding of that. He says, so whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, and the Father may be glorified in and through the Son. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Again, Jesus is saying, I'm about to go. I know this is going to be tough, but I'm going to give you someone that will be with you forever. And he is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he actually already dwells with you and will be in you. See, Jesus makes this promise to his followers, and I believe promise still applies to you, even where you're watching today, uh, in whatever circumstances you're facing, whatever fear you might have is that there is a spirit of truth. There's the spirit and the presence of God that Jesus promises that will be with you forever. He calls him a helper. I don't know about you, I need some help from time to time. I need some help right now. I need some truth right now. Later, he's referred to as a comforter or an advocate, someone who comes alongside, who brings hope in the midst of hopeless experiences, who brings clarity, who brings uh, conviction that leads us in the right path that this is the Holy Spirit of God. And Jesus says, actually, you will know him because he's already with you. And I just want to encourage you today that no matter what you might feel and what you might be facing, the questions you might have, how distant or how close you might feel to God, how long it's been since you've been in church or how hard your life has been because of the choices that you made, that you feel that God has gone at a distance. Actually, God has never been further away than he is right now because he's already near through his Holy Spirit. It's already near. 
that Jesus would say, God is even closer than you think. That, that, that when, even when we feel most distant and most disconnected from God, because of the person of the Holy Spirit, God is close. That God is not some ethereal concept or some even person you can have a relationship with, but is far away up in heaven, either vertically or some other realm, however that works in your mind. Like, God is not just something distant. God is not just a historical figure that Jesus who walked on this planet, who was documented more than any other person in history. Jesus is not just a historical figure. God is not just a historical figure that happened a long time ago in a land far, far away. That actually God is the Holy Spirit that is present and available to you right where you sit in 2020 with your job loss, with your illness, as you're parenting your little ones, as you're trying to figure out what it means uh, to be a follower of Jesus and be the first one in your family, what it looks like to live and practice the presence of God at your workplace or in your neighborhood, that the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit is near, is in you, and will be with you. And so what do we do with that? How does that change our life? And again, this is a three-week conversation, so I hope you'll come back and view with us again next Sunday as we continue the conversation But specifically for this moment, this morning, or whenever it is you're watching later, my hope is that we would simply become more aware that that's available. I think for many of us, that is the most important. And the first step is to simply practice the presence of God. To suspend disbelief, perhaps, and to just acknowledge for a moment, what if? What if God is actually closer than you think? What if God is actually with you right now? When you hear that phrase, what, what comes up inside of you? Is it, is it fear? Did God see what I did on Friday? Is, is it guilt? Oh, I'm, I'm not so good. God can't be with me. Is it hope? Oh, thank God, literally, that he is here. Is it courage? See, when Jesus shared this with his followers, what he hoped it would create in them, what I believe he hopes it will create in you, is this sense of belonging and this sense of empowerment. That that God already is with you, that you belong to him. He invites you to be aware of his presence. He's already aware of yours. He wants to be in a relationship with you and he wants to give you the power that he has to be able to ask for whatever it is you want. And he will listen, he will be there. And for many of us, when it comes to this idea of the Holy Spirit, we can kind of make it more complicated than it actually is. Uh, we, can, we can get stuck behind religious tradition or uh, religious language, or we can get tongue-tied theologically around this or that or how. Or, you know, and, and many people have made all kinds of different claims, but I just want to make it as simple and practical as I possibly can because even if you don't understand it fully, you can still engage with it. In fact, Father Richard Rohr puts it this way. It says that we can't actually attain the presence of God. I, I love this quote specifically right now because here we are scattered throughout our city watching on you know, live stream, that, that sometimes we think, oh, if I go to church, that's where God is. That, you know, if I'm, if I'm with other people in my small group, that's where God is. Or I feel close to God during worship, and, and, and I do as well. But the reality is, is that it's not a place that changes that. It's our perspective in those moments. And he says, you can't attain the presence of God because we're already in the presence of God. What's absent is our awareness. What's absent in my life that keeps me from accessing the power and the presence of God is not God. It's me. It's my busyness. It's my lack of connection and, and perspective. It's my you know, choice to fill my life with a bunch of other voices <laughs> rather than to go, God, you're actually right here, right now. Th- this week, we've had plenty of opportunity to jump and attach and, and, and connect with what's coming into our screens from our phone or from the news to listen to other people's fears or other people's projections. And we want to listen to wise advice and wise counsel. But how often this week have you paused, have I paused and said, God, actually, I I trust that you're here in this. That if you're the spirit of truth, I I want to know what you have to say. I want to know what you would advise for me. This, This is the experience that we are invited to have as followers of Jesus is to live in the ever-present presence of God through the person of the Holy Spirit. That, that, that's what God has made available to you. That the reality is that the Holy Spirit is not just a concept to be understood, uh, but it's a person to be experienced. 
The Holy Spirit is not a concept to be understood. It's a person to be experienced, to be engaged with on a daily, moment-by-moment basis. I remember when I was uh, taking a class, uh, you know, kind of to learn more about the Holy Spirit. And that's just such a weird concept where, you know, the idea of a person of God becoming something I can get graded on. Um, I almost wanted to get a D just because with the two-thirds, you know, just, anyway, all right, full circle, right? Um, and I remember having this conversation around all of the things that people think, and I love learning about this, and, and I would encourage you to do so. But if the Holy Spirit is just a concept that we learn about and argue about and debate about or disagree with others about, we actually miss the power of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. The Holy Spirit is not just a concept to be understood. It's a person to be experienced. I love that this plays in so well with what we're dealing with today. I am not a technical person. Uh, I know just enough to be dangerous. So I'm so grateful for all of our servant leaders that help make this moment even happen. I don't know how this live stream technology works. Like I know how to engage with people face to face. I don't know how me talking goes into a camera through the World Wide Web, surfs around, and then finds its way to many different places on your phone and your tablet and your computer right now. Live. I don't know how that works. If you asked me to explain it, I would ruin it. But I do know that you can hear my voice. I do know that we can engage right now in real time with prayer requests to one another for people that are vulnerable in our city for what it is that you're facing and the fear that you might have. I know that right now, you know, technology that I can't explain, that I don't understand, I engage with regularly and seamlessly. We do that all the time. What if just this week, the way that we engage with technology, that we don't understand fully, but we engage with regularly, was how we engage with God via the person of the Holy Spirit? What, what if we made that shift? that we might not understand all that there is about the Holy Spirit. And, and certainly in the three-week series, there's no way that we can explain and talk about all of the facets. Uh, you know, I had someone once tell me, anyone that claims to understand the Trinity doesn't understand the Trinity, <laughs> right? And I think they're right. You know, I mean, we could spend all of the rest of the time that we have talking about this, and we still wouldn't fully grasp it. But what we can do is engage with it. We can engage with it freely. So that's my hope for this next week, is that we would simply shift our attention. And I want to give you a practical way to do that. What if for this next week, these next few days, as you are engaging in whatever comes your way, as you're watching your kids at home from school, or you're going to your job, or you've lost your job, or your hours have been cut, as you face the financial realities of our culture and our country right now, as, as you engage in conversations with people, either from a safe distance or via technology, that are facing fear, what if you shifted your attention to engage with the Holy Spirit in that moment and simply prayed, not necessarily even out loud, but just in your heart, and you prayed to the Holy Spirit? It's easy for us to say, dear God, or dear Jesus. Uh, you know, our, our kids you know, are in a Christian preschool, and they've been taught this very beautiful but incredibly theologically inaccurate prayer. Um, and it's cute when you're four, Right? But for us to actually grow up and to actually the person that I can engage with right now in this presence is the Holy Spirit of God. So what if we pray to the third member of the Trinity this week? Say, Holy Spirit, I need your presence. I want to be aware of your presence. I need your power. I'm feeling weak. I need your wisdom. I don't know what to do. I need your hope. I need you to comfort and advocate for me because I don't know where to turn and I don't know how to respond to whatever it is that I'm facing right now. Believe me, Jesus will still be there after this week for you to pray back to if you'd like. And God the Father hears you. But the Bible teaches that when we pray, God hears our prayers because the Holy Spirit passes it along. That the Holy Spirit is the one that advocates for you and I on our behalf to God the Father. And so what if we engaged our attention to the presence of the Holy Spirit this week? What if by doing that, it gave us power? It, it gave us courage. It helped us be like those first century Christians who reached out in ways that people didn't understand because they had the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so they didn't fear critique. They didn't fear death. They didn't fear persecution. And they didn't run and hide, but they engaged in new ways in their community. So this week, pray, Holy Spirit, what would you have me do? God, I'm afraid for 
my parents or my grandparents. They're older and they're vulnerable. I'm, I'm nervous for those that I love that have lower immunity for whatever reason or pre-existing conditions. That This virus isn't as much of a threat to me, but it is to them. How can I live in the way of love with your power, Holy Spirit? So as you check in on people this week, as you look for ways to serve those who are vulnerable, as you watch your neighbor's kids for an hour, can I get an amen? <laughs> as you share a resource, as you tip well, knowing that people uh, that might be going to your coffee shop or restaurant uh, is lower, as you take the risk when you have a conversation with someone and they express nervousness, to simply offer a word of encouragement or ask, can I pray for you? That in the quietness of your own heart and your own life, you would engage with the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. One of my favorite pastors says, engaging with the Holy Spirit is kind of like a fish in water. We often ask, like Philip does, I want to see, I want to experience God. And yet, we're already living fully immersed in the presence of God, just like a fish doesn't know about water because that's all the fish knows. It's its life. It's its environment. I want you to know that's true for you right now in your home, wherever you're watching. If you're watching later, we don't know what the future holds. We don't know what tomorrow brings. And I love that after promising us the Holy Spirit, Jesus goes on to talk about anxiety. And so if you have that tab open, if you're reading in your Bible, keep reading through John 14. It's absolutely appropriate right now. But the only reason we can face tomorrow with faith and with hope is because the presence of God is here with us through the person of the Holy Spirit. So I want to invite you to actually pray with me right now, wherever you are. Uh, we take a posture here at Restoration Church where we pray with open hands. You might have been taught to pray like this. That was really just because your mom didn't want you poking your brother or sister. Uh, you know, but we want to be open to the reality of the presence of God that is already here. So I would invite you, wherever you are, uh, to just open up your hands and, and have a moment of quiet prayer with me as we pray to the person of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit of God, thank you that your presence is already here. We don't have to invite you. <laughs> we simply ask that our awareness would grow of you. There's so much about who you are and how this all works that I don't understand. And, and I pray that that gives people hope that they don't have to fully grasp all the information around it in order to engage with you. And so this week, God, I pray that Holy Spirit, you would illuminate our hearts. You would illuminate our fears to us. You would illuminate the places that we feel scarcity or lack and that we can invite you in. That we could turn our inner monologue of fear and anxiety into a dialogue with you, Holy Spirit, knowing that you are already present. Thank you that you're here. Thank you that you're with us. You know us. That we can know and engage and experience you. So Holy Spirit, would you do something in our life this week? Would you empower us to be the church that we were called to be, to love people well, to serve and to show up, to connect in community in, in safe and healthy ways, and, and even as we limit our gatherings to online, that that's because we're listening to you, and you desperately and deeply care for every person in our community, especially those right now that are most vulnerable to the spread of this COVID-19 virus. And God, uh, we, we want to be your people. So Holy Spirit, move in power, move in presence. Be in us and with us, with new awareness to us this week. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm so glad uh, that you are here. I pray that that message spoke to your heart. We're going to continue uh, with our gathering as we sing and as we continue to worship uh, but as the band comes up, I just want to encourage you, if you're uh, viewing here online, restorationchurchsd.com slash live, either right now in person or you're hearing this uh, on a later date, we want you to know uh, that one of the best ways that you could actually participate and partner with us in this specific moment is to actually give generously. And we don't want this to be the time when the church shrinks back, but we want this to be a space where as Restoration Church, we live out our values of giving more than is required and step into generosity because we know that there are people in our communities that are going to need very specific and tangible help in these coming weeks. There, there are single parents that as much as it's stress uh, for our family, and, and I'm sure for yours, be like, oh, I got to watch my kids and figure out daycare. And, you know, th there are places in our community, people that we know 
that their choice is to stay with their kids or put food on the table. And, and so we want to be a place that can resource uh, those friends and those neighbors. And so when you give, uh, you not only help create moments like this, but every you know, investment that comes into our house, 10% of that goes out into our community or around the world uh, in moments like this. Uh, we, we give away 10% of everything that comes in because we believe that God says when we do that, he will bless the other 90%, and we can do more with that than we could with the whole. And so that's something that we live into as a community. And so when you give, you not only participate into making sure there's cameras so we can connect with you uh, this way, but actually making a tangible difference in our community and around the world. And so I would invite you, if you're at restorationchurchsd.com slash live, you can scroll down, or you can go to restorationchurchsd.com slash give. You can give right there uh, from your internet window uh, on your phone or your TV or your computer, or you can text any amount to 84321, and it will prompt you with a couple quick questions, and you can set up online giving. You can give one time, you can give reoccurring, so that we can continue to be a place and a voice of hope and peace and restoration here in San Diego and around the world as many people are facing uh, this fear and this reality of the COVID-19 virus. And so we want to be a place of tangible help. And so we need your help uh, to help us do that. And so thank you so much for giving generously. Thank you for being a part of this. Uh, thank you for those of you that have already gone above and beyond your regular giving in this time uh, to help us not only have this experience, uh, but to be a place of restoration for others. And so give you a moment to give, give you a moment to worship that way. This is a great time as well. If you want to scroll down, you can put in a prayer request. Our team is actively praying for you. And you can also scroll down to the bottom of that page and see prayer requests that have been submitted and click that button like Pastor Katie said earlier to let people know that you've prayed for them. What an incredible way for us to be connected as a community, even though we're socially distant at this time. So give with joy and generosity. We pray, as the proverb says, that the world of the generous would get larger and larger, and that would be true of you in this moment. So thanks for joining us. In just a minute, we're going to sing a couple songs about the Holy Spirit and about how God wants to move in power and presence in your life this week that I hope encourages you.